Slavery, the practice of treating some human beings as the property of others, was an all too real institution in the societies that we've been exploring of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And so by looking at the way that the philosophers of the ancient world treat slavery, we can gain insights into the meaning and the limits of justice. Now, before we explore the meaning of slavery for the ancient thinkers of justice, we must recognize one fundamental difference between ancient and modern slavery, and that is the concept of race. Ancient and modern slavery are more alike than many people often recognize, but there is this true, genuine, fundamental difference, that ancient slavery is not race-based. It's not race-based in practice, and it's not race-based in theory. The idea of race, that some humans are biologically determined to exhibit a certain potential, is a fundamentally medieval and modern concept. And modern slavery becomes intertwined with the ideology of race, which provides a way of justifying slavery in the modern world that the ancient thinkers don't use. And so when we think about slavery and justice in the ancient world, it's simply important to clean away from our ideas of slavery the concept of race, because race and slavery in the modern world go so fundamentally hand in hand. But let's explore three different ways of thinking about slavery in the Greek and Roman tradition. The Aristotelian way of thinking about slavery, the Roman law way of thinking about slavery, and the Roman Stoic way of thinking about slavery. Remember that Aristotle introduces slavery at the very beginning of his book, The Politics. Book one immediately explores the nature and significance of slavery. And in fact, Aristotle offers an account of what we called natural slave theory. Aristotle says that slavery is sometimes justified. And in fact, he does distinguish between slavery as it's practiced in his own world, which he says is sometimes just but is not necessarily just, and an idea of slavery, which he is going to explore in his philosophy of justice. And Aristotle says that sometimes slavery is just. And we want to think about the conditions that he says make slavery justified. He says that some people are naturally meant to be slaves, that nature intended some people to be slaves. And it's true that for Aristotle, this would mean non-Greeks. So Aristotle does have a kind of ethnic prejudice that's embedded in his account of natural slave theory. He thinks of the Greeks as especially rational, that they have powerful capabilities, powerful faculties of reason that enable them to exercise a kind of mastery over people who lack the full faculty of reason that the master has. Aristotle, in other words, thinks that some people are intended by nature to be slaves, that that is their telos, that is their purpose, because they lack the complete faculty of reason in the way that the Greeks, who are prepared to exercise mastery, have it. Aristotle's philosophy of slavery depends on his prejudice about Greeks and barbarians. It depends on his teleology, his belief that nature has fitted some individuals with a certain kind of purpose. But ultimately, you can think of Aristotle's justification of slavery in this simple way. Aristotle thinks that slavery is good for some people. Aristotle says slavery is sometimes just because it's in the best interests not of the master. For Aristotle, that would be unjust if the master were simply ruling for his own benefit. But slavery is just because it benefits the slave. And so Aristotle's slave theory says, for some individuals, it is the optimal way for them to achieve their end if they are in fact under the power of another. It's a jarring, it should be an unsettling, way of thinking about the world, but we need to recognize that Aristotle's moral and political theory is profoundly inegalitarian. He thinks that there are profound human differences and that these entail different, what we would call, rights and powers and honors, and in fact that these are so extreme that some people are meant by nature to be master and some people are meant by nature to be slaves. A second way, and truly a different, a fundamentally different way of thinking about slavery and its justification is preserved in the Roman tradition of law. 
And in fact, this provides us with some sense of the Roman ideology of slavery. Although it's noteworthy that there's not an elaborate justification of slavery in Roman society. Although the Romans have an extensive slave system, they don't have, in fact, an extensive ideology of slavery. But we can piece together from Roman law some concept of how the Romans justified their slave system. The Roman law preserves a fragment which says that a slave, a servus, is someone who has been captured in a battle by a Roman general and spared rather than killed. The Romans say that a slave is someone who has been captured in battle. Now, it's actually not the case in reality that all slaves in the Roman Empire were captives of war. But it's the way the Romans imagine their slave system. So again, the difference between reality and ideology, we're in the ideology of the Romans who have an extraordinary empire, an extraordinary army, an extraordinary war machine that has conquered the known world. And in their minds, their slave system is the fruit of conquest. Slaves are those who have been taken captive by Roman generals and brought back and sold rather than killed. And this is a profound ideology because think of what it means. It means that a slave is sort of the living dead. And in fact, the Roman lawyers make this analogy as well, that to be a slave is sort of like being alive without having life because you're deprived of the fundamental rights and dignities that attend normal human life. But for the Romans, this is acceptable. This is in fact just because a slave has been spared. And even this mitigated and limited existence is superior to death itself. And so the Romans can justify, they can rationalize their slave system as part of their conquest. And in fact, as a kind of justice, as a kind of mercy that's shown to the conquered peoples. And a third, fundamentally different way of thinking about slavery in the ancient world that's different from the Aristotelian rationalizations of natural slave theory and from the Roman law justification of slavery as the result of war. This is the Stoic view of slavery. Stoicism becomes the common philosophy of the early Roman Empire. Greek in origins, it spreads throughout the Roman world and becomes the most broadly accepted public philosophical school. Stoicism teaches a common humanity it teaches that virtue is the key to happiness. It teaches that the individual should discharge all of his obligations that society has imposed on him. Stoicism comes to think in profound ways about the problem of slavery, and in fact departs in many ways from the ideology that slavery was just. And so we will read some key texts in which Stoic philosophers under the Roman Empire reflect on the meaning of slavery. And two in particular are of importance and are revealing. The Roman senator who writes in Latin named Seneca, one of the most influential Stoic philosophers of the Roman Empire, and a Greek philosopher named Epictetus, who was himself a former slave and one of the most influential Stoics of the Roman Empire. Seneca writes about slavery, and he emphasizes pointedly that slaves are human beings. All slaves have humanity. In fact, Seneca says that he himself thinks of his slaves as though they were his brothers. And so as you read his moral epistles, you should see statements that in some ways remind you of the Christian idea of basic dignity. But at the same time, Stoicism was highly resigned to the idea that the world existed and that the world had natural hierarchies which were fundamentally part of the cosmos, the ordered universe. And in fact, you can see this in Seneca's own writings. There's one statement in his moral epistles that very clearly reflects this expectation. Seneca says, treat those in your power as you would want those in whose power you are to treat you. Think about what he says. Treat those who are beneath you, who are in your power, the way that you would want to be treated by those 
in whose power you are, those who are above you. It's a revealing statement because at one and the same time, it reminds us of the golden rule of Christianity to love others as yourself, but at the same time, it's so different because it imagines these kinds of obligations to others fundamentally situated within a hierarchy. It says to treat those who are below you the way that you would want to be treated by those above you. So it imagines that our obligations, our duties that we have in the world are situated in terms of our own individual context. And in fact, the Stoic philosophy is one that is in some ways passive. And this is evident in the writings of Epictetus. Epictetus is himself a freedman. He's a former slave in the Roman Empire. He's a profound philosopher. But even in the writings of this former slave, we never see any statement that slavery is fundamentally wrong. Epictetus would of course have agreed with Seneca that slaves were human beings, but he never says that slavery itself is wrong as an institution. Even though he himself had experienced it, he still imagines a world where there are masters and there are slaves. Stoicism teaches that fundamentally you can only control yourself internally. And in fact, Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, is one of the most profound teachers of the idea that true freedom is internal. Think about what this means. True freedom is internal. You're only free when you overcome your desires, your irrational fears, when you live your life morally, when you realize that you can only control the things that are in your control, the things that are up to you, as Epictetus says. And so Epictetus, although he had experienced legal slavery, says that only the wise man is free. Only the person who has conquered their desires can have true freedom. And so Stoicism is a philosophy that teaches freedom, but it's a kind of moral freedom that is detached from institutional, from legal reality. 